السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا أحدا فردا صمدا حيا قيوما نؤمن له بالربوبية ونقر له بالعبودية من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على أصيائه وخلفائه وعترته وأهل بيته عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل قال الله في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم وصل على محمد وآل محمد What does the Quran tell us about prophethood and about the basis of revelation? The attribute of mercy before establishing justice and before establishing prophethood and imamah, the continuation of prophethood, which are the pillars of faith, there is a basis. And this basis is mercy. Mercy is the basis of all action. The actions of God and the actions of the representatives of God and of godly people. The Quran describes God as the most merciful, as Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. And both of these words come from the same root of mercy, but Ar-Rahman is different in, than Ar-Rahim in that Ar-Rahman is a type of mercy which belongs solely to God. It is an unconditional mercy. It is an all-encompassing mercy. And for this, Allah says that His mercy encompasses all things. The Qur'an is also referred to as a mercy. It is referred to as a remedy, shifa, and also rahmah, mercy. The signs of God, some of them are also referred to as a mercy, such as in marriage. Allah says in marriage and union, there is rahmah, there is tranquility, and there is also rahmah, there is mercy in it. So, mercy is the basis of the actions of God. And so those who assimilate with the attributes of God, assimilate with the attribute of mercy. The prophetic hadith encourages believers to assimilate with the attributes of God. تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ الله, To have the attributes of God, such as mercy and such as generosity and forgiveness. And this is why the Prophet, who is the greatest manifestation of the characteristics of God, is referred to as Rahma, Rahmatan lil Alameen, a mercy to mankind, to all of mankind. Now, if we establish mercy as a basis for all things, for all of the creations of God, even the resources which exist on earth, the earth itself, all of it is created as a mercy. You know, there is just enough oxygen on earth for, for humans to be able to breathe and, and live comfortably. The same goes with other resources such as water and, and oil and, uh, and sun. All of this is created as a mercy. God did not create human beings and leave them alone to you know, find for themselves what resources. He created those resources and placed them at their disposal as well. 
So all of this is an act of mercy. All of it is an act of rahmah. And so because mercy is the basis of all action, God has sent down revelation through the prophets. Because God, and again going back to the basis of mercy, would not create a creature, a creation, hold that creation responsible, but then not send somebody to guide that creation. And so when we talk about the reason for why God has sent down prophets and why there is revelation, mercy is at the base of that. So that people are not left astray. They don't have to find guidance on their own. That there are people to bring guidance to them. And this is why the Islamic tradition teaches us that you know, the prophets which are mentioned in the Quran by name are about 25. 25 of the prophets approximately are mentioned by name in the Quran. But we know that there are many more prophets. There are about 124,000 prophets and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was Khatam al Anbiya. He was Khatam al Anbiya. He was the seal of prophethood, the final prophet, the one who finalized the message of the prophets that came before him. Now, because we have the mercy of God and because we have the immaturity of man in, in ethical perception, there needs to be prophets. There needs to be men who guide humanity to that which is good. And the job of, of these prophets was to shake the conscious, the conscious of men and show them good as good and evil as evil. See God as God and Satan as Satan. Because when you read about the beliefs and uh, you know, the, the, the deviation of earlier people, you realize that it was, most of it was born out of confusion. They could not, confusion, they could not recognize what was God and what was worthy of worship and what was evil and what should be refrained from. And so the prophets, some of them were there to uh, merely point their people in the right direction, to reveal the fallacy of their ideas. And this happened in different ways. You see that one of the prophets, he comes to people who worship the sun. And so in order to show them the falsity of their ways, he pretends to also worship the sun. When the sun goes down and the moon appears, he says, no, but the moon is better than the sun. You know, seeing the stars, the stars are more in number and they're brighter. So I choose to worship the moon instead of the sun, or I, I choose to worship the stars instead of the sun. This is to show them the fallacy of their ways, how their belief is uh, not sound, not founded on the right principles. Ibrahim, same thing. When he showed his people how their ways were wrong, what did he do? He tipped over the statues, he broke them. And he turned to them and said that it was the big guy who did it. He left the big one untouched. He said it was the big one that did it. And asked him, and if he could answer, he, he could reply, he'll tell you that he was the one that did it. And since he is in no power of replying, then you know, that, that proves to them that their logic is unfounded and it's not, it's not built on solid principles. Some prophets... They simply told their people that what you are doing is wrong and it's going to lead to your own destruction. Lut, for instance, he told his people that what you are engaging in right now is going to eventually lead to your annihilation. Whether, whether God punishes you or not, it's going to lead to your extinction. Men being with men, women being with women, no further generations emerging that eventually is going to lead to your own extinction. Nuh, for instance, we know. Nuh also called his people to the worship of God. The Quran says for 950 years, 1,000 actually, 1,000 minus 50 it says, 950 years. And at the end, Nuh begins to pray for the annihilation of his people. He, he, he requests that God annihilate his people after 950 years 
of preaching, he saw that after 950 years, it was enough to ask God to annihilate his people. Oh Allah, he says to them, and this is in Surah Nuh, annihilate them all, destroy them all. Because if you don't destroy them all, they will give birth to nothing but people who are deviant and people who are unbelievers. No more good can come out of them, out of these many generations which I've observed. There is no potential for good to emerge out of them. And so the prophets, it goes back to their message that their mission was to shake the conscience of their people so that they can see good as good and evil as evil. And so they revealed to them the fallacy of their ways and uh, they guided them to what was right. Now, in order for, for prophethood and for revelation to emerge out of this basis, the basis of mercy, it must mean that prophets and messengers brought their revelation or were sent with revelation to most of the people who lived on earth if not all of the people who lived. And the Qur'an really is, again, only mentions about 25 messengers or prophets by name. But it does not go beyond that. There are other names which are mentioned in the books of history and also in the books of Hadith, prophets of Banu Israel, for instance, who are mentioned by name. But that's the extent to which the Qur'an and the Hadith goes to. Now, 124,000 prophets. This must mean that there are different areas across the world where prophets and messengers were sent to. Not all prophets and messengers were sent with scrolls or books. And some prophets were not sent for all of mankind. Some prophets and messengers were sent for local tribes and local people. Now, there's an interesting commentary on uh, Surah Teen. Now this is a chapter which according to commentators was revealed in Mecca. And one indicator that it was revealed in the city of Mecca was Allah says, وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينِ The wow in the beginning is wow al qasam So God is swearing by something. When this wow is found at the beginning of the verse, it is referred to as wow al qasam. God is swearing by something, and, and that thing is, is something of importance that God is swearing by. وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينِ This balad, this land, al amin, it's, it's a, a safe, protected land, a sacred land. And that is the land of Mecca. Mecca has, from during the days of Ibrahim, been a sacred land. It has been protected. There are, there are laws which protect the land of Mecca. And uh, for those of you who, who have traveled to Mecca before, either during the Umrah or the Hajj in the state of Ihram, there are certain laws of the land which must be observed. So no fighting to take place, uh, no killing to take place, uh, no unwanted, unwarranted killing of animals, uh, plants and trees, and things which grow of the earth must also be respected. They cannot be you know, pulled out or extracted for no reason. It's a sacred land. It's a protected land, which is referred to as Al-Balad Al-Amin. Now, some commentaries say the following. It's interesting. They say that the lands, the, the, the signs which are mentioned in the beginning of this chapter refer, refer to four places and four, four places which refer to four messengers, if you will. So Al-Balad Al-Amin is Mecca. It is the land of whom? Which Prophet? Land of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Zaytun refers to the olive which refers to the Levant and the area of, of Palestine which refers to uh, Isa Alaihi Salaam. Uh, Sinin, the Mount, Mount Sinai refers to Musa. And here's the interesting part. 
the teen, what does the teen refer to? The teen, they say, and, and this, this opinion actually emerges from uh, you know, people in Southeast Asia, and, and you can see why. They, they say that, and of course it's an opinion, whether right or wrong, that the teen refers to the fig tree that the Buddha sat under and received enlightenment. And whether it's right or wrong, I mean, it is an opinion which exists. Now, this would allude, if, if true, that there are messengers which are sent to all of humanity in different shapes, in, in different languages, in different forms. A messenger, a rasul, simply means a person with a message, a message coming from God. Now, the messengers, in order for them to be successful, required the cooperation of their people, or at least a few people. There are some messengers which emerged, which had a large following. Some of these messengers had a following of only a handful of people. Some of these messengers emerged and their own family members did not follow them, such as the Prophet Nuh. Some of his own family members did not follow him. His wife did not follow him. Uh, his sons did not follow him. Some of them did, some of them did not. Uh, the Prophet Lut, likewise, his wife did not follow him, but his daughters followed him. Uh, Isa السلام, was blessed with the 12 disciples, the Hawariin, who are mentioned in the Quran. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, <laughs> was also blessed with a nation of great followers. And for the success of this nation to continue, for the success of these people to continue, there needs to be sincere followers. And, and this is why you find that the prophets and the messengers, the habit that we know of was that they always left behind people after them. There were always righteous successors which would come after them. Now whether or not these successors were followed or not, most of the times the successors were not followed. Rarely were, did, were the successors had a large following of people. But there has to be some sort of cooperation by some of the followers of these prophets in order for the message to thrive and prosper. And of course, in the case of our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, <laughs> the seal of the prophets, Khatamul Anbiya, the prophet had a sincere following which was manifested through some of his closest companions. And before them, his family members, the Ahlul Bayt And this is why the Prophet made it a point throughout his entire life. It, it was not just towards the end of his life. Some people assume that it was one event towards the end of his life that the Prophet stood and, and he appointed Ali as his wali. And you know, they say his wali is his friend not his successor. A number of events throughout the life of the, the Prophet and throughout the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen tell us of this eminent succession which is to come after the Prophet. From the beginning, the first believer, the first male believer in the Prophet was his cousin Amir al-Mu'mineen. From the beginning, as a child of only 10 years old, the first person to go out in battle for the Prophet was this young man. And for this reason, the Prophet made it a point to tell the people of the position that Amir al-Mu'mineen held with him. It's interesting because most of the battles that the Prophet participated in, most of the, the battles, Amir al-Mu'mineen was on his side. There was only one battle which Amir al-Mu'mineen stayed behind and that was because of the direction of the Prophet, the, the command of the Prophet. And this is a battle which took place towards the end of the life of the Prophet, the Battle of Tabuk, which was a journey from, Mecca, from Medina to an area known as Tabuk, which is today in Northern Arabia, in the Northern Arabian, Southern Jordanian desert. And this journey, commentators tell us, that took about four months and it was not an easy journey. Some commentators, they state that 
the Muslims had such little to eat and drink that they would share their dates. They would take one date and three, three people would share one date. So it would be split in half, two people would eat and then, and then the third unlucky person would be left with the seed to place in his mouth for, for the nutrients from the seed of uh, the date. And so for this expedition, the Prophet chose for Amir al-Mu'mineen to stay behind. And he stayed behind because the Prophet towards the end of his life started realizing that you know, things might not be very settled after his life. The Prophet began to notice signs. And it was not only the Prophet himself that noticed signs. Allah speaks directly to the Prophet. There's an entire chapter dedicated, and it is the chapter which comes directly after Surah Al-Jum'ah, Surah Al-Munafiqoon, which speaks of the hypocrites. There would be no need for God to dedicate an entire chapter to the hypocrites if there were no hypocrites. I mean, there's, there's clear condemnation of the polytheists, the idol worshippers. There is clear condemnation of some of the people of the book who conspired against the Prophet. There's enough of that in the Qur'an. Well, why an entire chapter dedicated to the hypocrites? We have to think about this. In another chapter, the Qur'an says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, there are hypocrites that are among you that you do not recognize. You do not know them, we know them. Even you do not know them, even you do not recognize them. So the Prophet had signs, so towards the end, he left in this battle, he left behind Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now some of the companions, you know, some, some of the companions, every chance that they had, they would try to demean Amir al-Mu'mineen. They would try to take something away from him. And so they began to talk amongst themselves during the journey, during the expedition. They began to say, look at, look at Ali, he has to stay and protect the women and the children. And so the news, the hadith, the, the commentary says the news reached Amir al-Mu'mineen. So he wrote, he wrote, he sent, Amir al-Mu'mineen sent a letter to the Prophet that this is what they are saying about me. And so the response of the Prophet to Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says to him, he says to him, leave what they say. Forget about what they say. Ama tarda, are you not happy enough, satisfied enough? أَمَا تَرْضَى أَن تَكُونَ مِنِّي بِمَنْزِلَةِ هَارُونَ مِنْ مُوسَى Is it not enough pride for you that you are to me as Harun was to Musa, as Aaron was to Moses? And what was Aaron to Moses? He was his brother and he was his successor. He was his representative. When Moses left his people to speak to his Lord, he left behind whom? He left behind Harun. And when he came back, Harun says, O oh Musa, the people that you have left behind, they have tried to kill me. They have tried to murder me. And Musa came back and he saw his people in a different state that he had left them in. And of course, after Musa and after Harun, his, uh, his successor was Yusha bin Nun, Joshua. And he was the one who brought uh, the people, Banu Israel, back into uh, the promised land, the land of Palestine. So there was always talk of a successor which would come after. Isa alayhi salam, he had his 12 disciples, his 12 hawariyin, his companions. And among them he chose to lead the community after him, his maternal cousin, Simon Peter. However, many people, they left, they did not follow and, and they followed somebody else. And so the teachings, uh, according to the Islamic tradition, the teachings of Jesus Christ, Isa alayhi salam, changed from what they were meant to be to what they are today. So the prophets always left companions, they always left, they always left successors behind them. Why? Because in order for their message to be successful, there has to be successful people and there, there has to be uh, sincere people who follow them. And these sincere people can even be, it can even be one person. As long as there is one sincere person to follow that prophet, that representative of God, that's all that it is required. You know, God thinks in terms of quality and not quantity. And this is why there is, you know, so much in the hadith which gives quality 
to one believer. And so much in the Quran which, which gives a, a praise of, of even one believer, if there is even one believer. One hadith says, المؤمن أعز على الله من الكعبة That the believer, one believer, is more dear to God than his house of worship, than his own house of worship, his own Kaaba. And this reminds us of uh, the rights that we have towards our believing brothers and sisters. Now, the prophets also acted as witnesses. Shaheed, the word shaheed appears in the Quran, either for their people or against their people. And the Quran tells the believers, it says that, well, what situation would you find yourself on the day that people are resurrected and their leaders are witnesses against them and you will find a rasul meaning the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad What if you were to find him as a witness against you? What if he appeared today and he stood as a witness not for you, but against you. What would you do? What sort of state would you find yourself in? And this is how the Prophet was different from others because the Prophet, even with what he saw, the, the, the torment that he saw, the neglect that he saw, the abuse that he saw, he prayed for the salvation of his people. He, prayed, he continuously prayed for the salvation of his people. You know, his wife Khadija had asked him, she said, you are a Prophet, you are a truthful Prophet, the first lady to believe in him. She said, you can ask God to punish these people. He said, I was not sent as a punishment. I was sent as a mercy and a blessing. There is a, one hadith that says that as the Prophet was experiencing his final moments of life, because the Prophet, the Quran reminds us, is mortal. His life comes to an end. He, he does not live forever. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِمَّاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ That Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Muhammad وعلي Muhammad is not but a messenger like the messengers that came before him. If he was to die, the Quran is asserting, if he is to, to die or be killed, the Quran says, would you turn away? So the Prophet was mortal and the people knew that his life would come to an end. And in fact, the Prophet reminded them. You know, one of, the, one of the sermons that the Prophet gave towards the end of his life in which he reiterated that Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib would be his successor and his wazir after him. He said in it, in the beginning, أَيُّهَا nas, O people, Yushaku and Uda fa ujib. O people, I am about to be called upon and I must respond. What does that mean? Who am I going to be called upon? By my Lord. And I must respond to my Lord. I cannot say, No, my Lord, I, I need a few more years. I have two, three years of, of business that I have going on. I have to continue. No, when, when the time comes, the time comes. That's it. Even the Prophet cannot negotiate. Even the hadith tells us that the, that the angel of death himself cannot negotiate. That when everyone, there will come a time where everyone will cease to exist. After all of the souls are taken by the angel of death. After the angels are taken, they cease to, to exist at that time. There remains two. There remains Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, the almighty, and Malikul Maut, the taker of souls. And it is at that time that God even takes Malikul Maut away. And then God asks the question, the tradition tells us, God asks the question, Limanul Mulkul Yom, to whom belongs all of the authority today? And the reply is, Lillahi al Wahid al Qahar. It solely belongs to Allah. Al Wahid, the one, the one true God, Al Qahar, the one who brings an end to everything, who makes everything cease to exist. So even the Prophet is a mortal man. The tradition tells us that as the Prophet was in his final moments, the angel of death approached him. And he began to take the life of the Prophet. He began to return the soul of the Prophet. And the Prophet began to feel a little bit of pain, just a little bit of pain. 
You know, the Quran tells us of how the soul will be taken from the body. Kalla ida balagat it taraqi. When it when when it passes taraqi. Taraqi is the, the plural of the word turqwa. The collarbone is the turqwa. When it is taken and it is about to exit the body from down up, and it reaches this part, the collarbone. The Quran describes in detail. So as the soul of the Prophet was being taken, and according to the Shi'i tradition, of course he was his, his head in the lap of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Rasulullah questioned Malik al Maut. He said, he began to feel a little bit of pain. He said, is this the type of pain that my ummah will feel at the time of death? Is this how painful death is? Malik al Maut tells him, Ya Rasulullah, this is not an ounce of the pain that your people will feel. You are the best of creation. You don't feel the pain of death. For you, death is ease, it is returning to Allah. So the Prophet said in that moment, he said to him, then I want you to remove the pain of my people and I want you to exert that pain upon me. I want to handle their pain so that they don't have to handle the pain of death. At his last moments, when the Prophet is returning to Allah, he is thinking of whom? He's thinking of his people. And this is why the Quran tells us in many chapters you know, you wonder why there are so many chapters which address the, the topic of conduct with the Prophet. How to conduct yourself with the Prophet. Look at chapter 24, Surah Al-Nur. Chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab. Surah Al-Hujarat, Surah Al-Mujadala. In all of these chapters, God tells the believers how to treat the Prophet. O people, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet. O people, do not call the Prophet by his name. O oh people, the Prophet is not your friend or your father. O oh people, if you are invited to eat to a meal at the Prophet's home, respect his privacy. O oh people, do not linger inside the home of the Prophet. O oh people, if you speak to the wives of the Prophet, don't speak to them like they're your sisters. They are the wives of the Prophet. All of this you know, detailed conduct, why? Because the Prophet was the Prophet. He was Khatamul Anbiya. There was nobody like him. He was the greatest. He was the seal. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And with that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the intercession of our beloved Holy Prophet and his household. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa ladina amanu wa aminu salihat وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليخره على الدين كله اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على أوصيائه وخلفائه علي أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين وعلى البضعة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وعلى سبط نبي الرحمة وسيد شباب أهل الجنة الحسن والحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل Brothers and sisters, I'd like to share with you a couple of traditions which are narrated on the authority of our Prophet Isa عليه السلام, Jesus and many of these ahadith are to be found in Islamic literature. And since we discussed the issue in the first khutbah of prophecy, and 
how prophets would leave behind successors or tell of the successors were to come after them. This hadith says the following. It says that Allah said to Isa السلام, I shall send after you a religious community who, when I am generous to them, give thanks and praise. And when I withhold, are patient and content without their having any forbearance or knowledge. Jesus asked, but how can they do this, O Allah, without forbearance or knowledge? So how can they give thanks when you provide for them if they have no knowledge? And how can they be patient when you withhold from them? O God, without, but how can they do this, O God, without forbearance or knowledge? God replied, I grant them some of my own forbearance and knowledge. Meaning that the knowledge that we have comes from whom? God. And the forbearance from whom? And the generosity and the kindness and the love, does it come from ourself or does it come from God? Certainly it comes from God. Every good comes from God. And this is interesting because some commentators, they say that this is a, a sign of the prophecy which was to come after Isa salam. Because after Isa, about 600 years, and this is disputed, whether there were messengers which came after. And so Khatam al-Anbiya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad came at this time, 600 years after. And of course in the Qur'an, the Qur'an speaks on behalf of Isa alayhi salam that he says that there will be a prophet which will come after me by the name of Ahmad. And Ahmad is one of the names of our prophet. And some say there is also allusion in the Bible. And the verse is, is in the book of Matthew 23, 34. It says the following. It says, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. So we know that the prophets, many of them who were sent to Bani Israel were killed. Yahya, for instance, John, John the Baptist was killed and he was beheaded. In fact, the hadith of the sixth Imam, Imam al-Sadiq he says that the, that the skies weeped blood for 40 days on two occasions. Once when Yahya was killed by his people and once when Hussein was killed by his people. So those were, those were two times that, and we know of how they were, you know, if, if you read the books of uh, history, the history of the prophets, you'll see how their people treated them. You know, the, 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 the types of, of torture and, and torment and death, uh, you know, the, the way that they treated their prophets. This is telling them that some of them are going to be killed, you are going to kill. And it is, it is only the last part of the verse which is interesting, which says, and persecute them from city to city you will begin to chase them from city to city. And they say that this is an allusion to uh, what, what happens with the Prophet Muhammad as he is chased with his followers from his home city in Mecca to Medina. Another tradition, and I will end with this one, is something which has to do more with ethics and morals. And this stood out to me as I was reading this this morning. Jesus was asked, the hadith says, which of your deeds is the best? Which of your deeds is the best? Which one has the highest value? He answered, leaving alone that which does not concern me. That's the best deed that you can have. Minding your own business. You know, they tell you mind your own business. That's literally the, the best advice that you can get. If you mind your own business, that's the best thing you can do. There is a few lines of poetry attributed to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says, لسانك لا تذكر به عورة مرئن فكلك عورات وللناس ألسنوا وَعَيْنَاكَ إِنْ أَبْدَتْ إِلَيْكَ مَعَايِبًا فَدَعْهَا وَقُلْ يَا عَيْنْ لِلنَّاسِ أَعْيُنُوا Don't use your tongue, he is saying, to mention the faults of others. Because you are full of faults. Look at yourself. You're full of faults and people have tongues. You can talk about them, but they can also talk about you. And if your eyes look at something, gaze upon something which they should not, tell your eyes, look away. For people also have eyes to look upon my faults as well. You know, they say when you get smart, you try to change the entire world. When you get smart, you try to change the world. But when you become wise, you try to change yourself. 
So changing yourself is the greatest way to change the world. Change yourself. That will influence your family. Your family will influence your community. Your community will influence your nation. And your nation will influence other nations. So the best way to change or, or, or is to mind our own business, is to remember our own faults before remembering others' faults. And with that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us in this holy day and in this holy month, the month of Rajab, a month which is full of blessings, a month which is full of mercy, a month which the Prophet describes as the month of Allah. It is dedicated to the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah that He forgives us and that He brings relief and sustenance to all those who are oppressed regardless of religion and regardless of race and ethnicity across the entire world. Oh Allah, bring for us security and bring for us freedom. Oh Allah, bring for us protection and for our families and for our loved ones and for all those who are oppressed across the world. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم قوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله